I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, I'm delighted to welcome back one of my favorite guests. His name is Chris Kellogg. He is a captivating storyteller, and he's written an awesome book. It is called Outdoor Adventures and Misadventures. This book is a treasury of tales ranging from deep sea fishing in the Bahamas to big game hunting in Kenya, and from the rustic charm of the Catskills to the glamorous life of Palm Beach society. Chris brings his rich experiences to life, sharing stories that are as heartwarming and thrilling as they are humorous. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank our team at Atticus Publishing for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel and purchasing his wonderful book. The links are below this interview. Chris, great to see you here today on Spotlight. Thank you, Logan. I've uh, enjoyed writing these books. It's uh, 10 years now that I've been doing this. And uh, I just added up the stories and it came out to uh, 143 in stories in the first book and 78 in the second book, 221 stories. So hopefully there's a story for everybody in there. And the variety of stories are quite, quite interesting. The responses are very varied as well. But I wrote them uh, after some adventure or misadventure and uh, wrote them for uh, my friends uh, and sent the stories out and then started accumulating them till the, the point that I thought, well, really, I should put them into a book. And uh, it's been uh, quite exciting to do that and challenging as well for me. Exactly. I'm sure it's fun also that you get to you know, rack your brain, relive uh, these adventures and misadventures from the past and take a great stroll down memory lane. Uh, you've had so many exciting chapters in your life, funny, adventurous, thrilling. Uh, so we're glad you put them down on paper. Is talking there a about favorite that. story that you'd like to share? Oh, absolutely. Uh, but quickly talking about that, I, I found that doing logs, I have log books starting from 1957 on hunting and interesting things that are no longer possible, like leasing land to hunt uh, birds on. My uh, mother and her brother had 66,000 acres under lease for five to 10 cents an acre. I mean, that just doesn't exist. And so it was important to put that in, in writing. Uh, I do have a, a kind of a, one, a lot of funny stories here that I was going through it. And one of the favorites is saving uh, the, the save the sandpiper in Palm Beach. There's something like, uh, well, here it is in Palm Beach. There are 500 black tie events. There are events for every known disease and cause that you can possibly think of. That is except for the lowly sandpiper, the sandpiper piper are threatened species. You can observe their plight and the ocean's edge. They are seen running for their lives as each wave crashes on the beach, covers up the only food supply. They're desperate, dashing back and forth to survive. This is a, uh, uh, actually a uh, uh, total, total misconception, but it's, it's a fun one. Please yep. donate as much as you possibly can or even more than you possibly can. You can mail a donation to Save the Sandpiper Society. Members can purchase banners, sculptures, coffee cups, hats, patches, blankets, and more. You receive a certified, notified, original membership confirmation in the mail before the kickoff party in November. There's much a march planned on Worth Avenue, so please attend if you can. And there is a black tie event at the Breakers. If you're a board member, we'll meet in Valley four times a year to count uh, birds while, of course, enjoying refreshments on the beach. Drunken Donkey is a favorite. Call 800 Five six one eight thousand sandpiper members will be paid, can be paid in Bitcoin or new coin or whatever the hell coin you you want. <laughs> Please hurry, as membership is limited only to those who can pay. If you have an NRI discount, remember you can use it as well. And, and <laughs> that's just a, that's an example great. of the nonsense that I've read. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's like sponsor a child. You'll get a picture of this child. In this case, you'll get a picture of that sandpiper. You'll follow that sandpiper as he or she goes through its life journey. I think that's great. That's really, really funny. One of the things that stu uh, stood out to me in your book was bagging the big five. Uh, that is quite an accomplishment. I believe it was a lion, leopard, buffalo, rhino, and elephant and dates back to 1961. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, one out of 12 safaris is able to do that. And the safari in 1961 was probably the most successful one in that time period. 
maybe forever. I, I don't know that we bagged the uh, largest elephant shot in the last 60 years with 150 pounds in each tusk. And uh, one of the largest leopards uh, that won the Air France trophy for my uncle. Um, bagging the, the big uh, five was at the age of 18 was just unreal. I can remember every moment of it was able going back to my notes, refreshing myself, able to write the stories. Some of them pretty frightening. We had a, a cow elephant charge us and uh, with a calf in back of it. And it came within about 30 feet of us before it heard the screaming of a native uh, and turned and ran the other way. We didn't want to shoot the, the, the cow and, or the calf. And uh, I had another experience where uh, around the village, I did a lot of what they call control work, which is shooting animals that were bothering the villages and causing problems, killing people and so forth. And and uh, this rhino was in the maize field, a cornfield right next to the village. So we got the villagers with pots and pans to come out and scare the rhino towards me. And it was a six foot high corn. So they put me in a tree. And as I as the, the rhino passed under the tree, I shot it and got it. And wow. everybody came out and it was a great celebration. Um, I shot a leopard that had lost half of its front paw and was eating the village dogs and they couldn't put the children on the street for fear of the leopard catching a child. Hmm. Um, I shot a, a, an elephant that was marauding a, a, a village. So all that was very, for me, gratifying that I was able to, 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 to do good in, as well as the licensing money that I paid went for the preservation of wildlife. And that, that was the main support for the preservation of wildlife, paying for the, the, the uh, conservation. Right. So and you were just 18 uh, years old when you're doing this, right? Uh, it was it was incredible. I couldn't believe that there wasn't a fence between me and, and the animals. And uh, I felt badly that I didn't know more about the animals because uh, I was a schoolboy and just, you know, offered this trip. Uh, my mother went on 20 safaris and she invited my uh, sister on another one with my father. And that's going to be in, in another book I'm working on right now, which is this book is based on her actual notes that she made during the trip. And she was uh, with uh, some of the most famous people at the time and a close friend of Richard Leakey's, mm -hmm. uh, a close friend of Bob Ruwalk. And she's in, in, in his book, in Uhuru. She's Kathy. And I normally don't tell people about that because it's her character that's in the book, not her actual uh, presence, because uh, she's raped and killed. And that, of course, didn't happen. But right. the, the exactly. stories are true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just been fictionalized, that's for sure. Your mother being a hunter uh, in that era is quite groundbreaking, right? It is. It is. It, it, and I think that's going to make sort of an out of Africa uh, type book. Uh, that was uh, there was a movie made of the, out of Africa and so forth about uh, uh, that time period and it's the, and, and it happens to be uh, the golden age of, of safaris the most luxurious uh, and there was plenty plentiful game and there wasn't what you see now where game is farmed and enclosed in high fences it's not the same and it's the hunting that's exciting it's not the shooting uh, that that makes a, a great trip. And so in those days, my mother was collecting for museums and collecting specimens, shooting little birds with uh, uh, dust. So it wouldn't hurt the bird, but would kill it so she could have it uh, fixed up to be sent off to uh, several museums. But uh, she, she put together uh, money that raised money for the first and second airplane for the Kenya Game Department, uh, a groundbreaking event and really meaningful. She, she also raised money for uh, backpacks for uh, counter uh, anti-poaching and anti-poaching vehicles and, and uh, crews, which really was substantially uh, helped deter some of the uh, the killing that was taking place. But it goes on today, yeah. which is kind of scary. And yeah. uh, I, I get a report from the Sabo National Park about animals being snared uh, today in great numbers. So. Uh, it's a, it's a problem based on the fact that when I was there, there were three and a half million people. Today, there's over 50 million people. And, and that's the, the root of the problem right there. Exactly. Exactly. Do you have any plans to do any more uh, safaris in the upcoming future? 
Well, I, I do do safaris uh, uh, in terms of hunting uh, birds. I'm, I'm really a bird hunter, and I do that because to me, hunting over the dog that I trained is the most exciting part of the hunting. I could go without the gun if I just take my dog out. And as a matter of fact, in dove shooting, uh, when I take Rosie out and I don't hit a few birds, she'll go and pick up somebody else's bird and bring it back. So maybe I don't need a gun. I'll just take Rosie. <laughs> Exactly. Sounds like Rosie's doing a little poaching herself there, grabbing other people's prey, right? Yeah, for sure. That's funny. Oh, what breed is uh, Rosie? Ro Rosie's a Llewellyn English setter, and she's restricted to my office, which is fine with me. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great. I've got Jack Russell Terriers. If they're restricted to my office, it'd be a little a little noisier than your office. So uh, uh, they're they're banished, unfortunately. Um, but I, I, I do safaris, if, if you will want to call it a safari. I go to Alaska once or twice a year. I used to go to Russia, but no longer. Uh, Russia, the Pinoy River was the most uh, 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 largest flow of, of uh, 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 game coming up the river. Uh, and we got about an average of five Atlantic salmon a week which if you go to Canada, you're lucky to get one. Right. Now, Alaska has, yeah. has the last tremendous amount of great fishing where you've got, uh, we've had days of catching uh, 20 uh, uh, fish that are 18 to 20 inches or catching some silver uh, salmon that are you know, 15 pounds, 10 pounds, pretty exciting stuff. And the Absolutely. bears to me are the most exciting. You've got bears that are eating a lot of fish, so they're not, looking to to harm you and uh, you you get to be within 20 30 40 50 feet of them so that's pretty thrilling <laughs> yeah that is thrilling when you head to alaska what season do you go well uh, june is is for kings and august is for silvers and uh the rainbows are pretty much in between and i i really like the silver salmons uh more because you're uh with the kings you're trolling and with uh, silvers, you're fly fishing, and I'm a fly fisherman. But uh, it's it's exciting. Yeah, and and really. surrounded by beautiful terrain while you're there as well, which is part of the magic. Where I go, they fly you out to different rivers every day, and so you get a different experience. And uh, some of them are float floating down the river, some are wading down the river. Uh, pretty in pretty incredible. Absolutely. In 2024, is it a tough age to be a hunter? I mean, it seems like the NRA is under attack. We mentioned that briefly before about the NRA. I mean, the, the big boss was forced to resign recently. It seems like, uh, you know, a lot of people are taking aim at the NRA when basically what they're doing is preserving the rights of hunters and gun owners. Well, I think there's, there's a misconception about um, hunting. 80% of the conservation efforts, more than that, probably closer to 90% of conservation comes from hunting licenses and contributions by hunters to preserve what they're, they're shooting because they want to see it come back the year after year. They don't want to see it decimated. And uh, bird watchers and other people who think they have an interest don't really support it. Um, uh, the the uh, guns have uh, been misunderstood in terms of uh, the assault rifle is pretty much a target rifle. It's not a, a decent rifle to, to shoot long distance. They're, they're really good for about 100 yards. Um, they, they're uh, used for shooting hogs. That's about it. Um, and, of course, there's a misuse of, of uh, everything you can think of, from, from drugs to knives to cars. So it, it's no different uh, than that. Exactly. It's a tool like any other tool. Some tools are used properly. Others are abused. Like you said, they sell beer in the supermarket. That could kill you if you drink enough of it. Uh, and the gun can be a useful tool in conservation efforts if used properly as well. I'll tell you, it could send you up to my uh, my uh, summer house in Connecticut. We've got quite a few bear there. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> We, I can tell you that uh, hunters are needed at times. And the same with the deer population as well. When there's nobody there to thin the herd, it gets a little crazy. Uh, I have another book that I'm, I think you'd be interested in. Um, it's uh, on cornbread. Mm. And the reason I, I, I want to write this book is, is uh, 
in Indian town where I go to shoot quail, uh, the, the lady who works in the kitchen uh, is Angel. And Angel uh, asked me, Mr. Chris, what would you like me to cook for you? Because I give her a nice tip. She says, I said, no, cornbread, what else? And I, no, just cornbread. So every week that I go out there, there's another cornbread that she prepares. Wow. And then she pairs it with African uh, game that you can also hunt on the property there. And it's called Fox Brown. They've got 3,000 acres and a lot of African wildlife. So uh, I think Angel in Indian Town doing cornbread has kind of a ring to it. Sounds great. <laughs> You're making me hungry. I'll take some beans and some collards along with that game when you have the have cornbread, that's for sure. Sounds great. Chris Kellogg has written an amazing book. As you can tell, he's a great storyteller. The book is called Outdoor Adventures and Misadventures. It's kind of a memoir. It's kind of his life story. Um, but of course, it tells fantastic journeys along the way as well, which he has experienced and uh, been part of throughout his life. It's a treasure of uh, tales ranging from deep sea fishing in the Bahamas to big game hunting in Kenya. And it is just as funny as it is adventurous. You will love this book. And we're looking forward to more releases coming out from this great author. Chris, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. To the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time, on Spotlight.